All right, everybody, you heard that music, so you know what time it is. It's Friday, and it's time for TV Talk, brought to you by the Ayn Rand Center UK, where we talk about uh, critically acclaimed and or popular TV shows from an objectivist perspective, and sometimes, uh, very few times, we make comparisons to Atlas Shrugged, which may be apropos in this case. Uh, in this case, we are dealing with the sci-fi series Expanse, The Expanse. Uh, it was a, a series that went for six seasons. We will only be talking about the first season, pilot episode and the and the uh, 10 episodes that followed. Uh, this uh, very interesting project, usually interesting is uh, Hollywood speak for, I'm not sure how I feel about it. I sort of like it and sort of don't. Um, uh, stars some 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 people you would know, uh, some people you wouldn't. Stephen Strait plays one of the main protagonists, uh, Jim Holden, who is the commander of this uh, this ice vessel. Uh, Dominique Tipper, no household names yet, uh, plays Naomi Nagata, who is an engineer on this vessel with Jim Holden. Wes Chatham uh, plays Amos Burton, one of my favorite characters, I have to say. Anybody who knows me, knows my character, knows my Twitter persona would say, yeah, Mark was probably uh, uh, separated from birth but from Amos uh, Burton. Uh, I'm not even going to try to pr pronounce Sharora Agadashlu's voice, but I just tried it. She plays a, a minister, I think, for the UN, trying to unravel one of the plot uh, points in the show. And there's a, a whole array of others, uh, namely uh, Thomas Jane, who plays the other protagonist, Joe Miller, a sort of a detective of, of the noir uh, genre in, in space. And uh, one of the other notables, Florence Favre, who is a Julie Mao, who's one of the mysteries that, uh, that uh, Joe Miller is trying to unravel that connects with these other three storylines. There's three storylines in this thing that all converge with each other. Uh, there's a cold war between Mars and Earth. A, a seemingly incendiary situation happens that pulls our, our hero, uh, Jim Holden, into a, a potential conspiracy to start a inter-solar system war between Earth, which is governed by the United Nations, gag me with a spoon, please, and Mars, which is sort of a Roman Republic or almost Moscow-ish or Spartan type of uh, kingdom. So I feel like we're watching the Peloponnesian War in in uh, interplanetary space. And then there is a mystery interwoven through this that connects these storylines, the, the war story, the, the, the attempt by the UN to figure out who's doing what to whom. Uh, and there's Thomas Jane, uh, the character who is the uh, detective searching for a missing person. Now, this person is uh, comes from wealth, uh, one of these wealthy families, uh, in, in politically connected families, but she happens to be a rebel working for the, the I guess, the OPA, uh, which is a group of rebels that live in what they call the belt, where they are basically crapped on by Mars and, and Earth in typical colonial fashion, the, the colonial powers being Earth and Mars, and they are the exploited workers uh, who are crapped upon by both and are in the midst of potentially rebelling against both sides. Um, for their humanity. She is on their side. She's disappeared. That's a, So there's a bunch of mysteries, a bunch of characters, three storylines that have to be solved, or at least somewhat resolved by the end of the series. Does it do it? I don't know. I'm going to ask my writer friends, Jennifer Buani and Jack Schumann. Jax is a fan of the show. Jennifer, I'm not sure how much. Guys, what did you think of this doggone series? Who wants to go first? Um, well, I'll go first because I know that we have uh, Expanse fans on our on our chat that are already excited about it. So let me let me be the one bearer of good news. <laughs> and I apologize if I start coughing. Allergy season is a bitch here in California. Um, uh, I loved it. I absolutely love the Expanse. I remember this is my second time watching it. Um, the first time I saw it was maybe three, it might've been during COVID actually, um, when we were just all desperate and binge watching everything and, a, a, a friend had recommended the show to me. Um, I found it was, it was very difficult to, because I haven't read the books. I knew that this, uh, uh this is based on a series of books by, um, who did, I just had the authors up, Ty Frank and, uh, who else was it? Oh, uh, I can't remember. Uh, no, James Corey, James Corey, James S.A. Corey and Ty Frank. 
So it's based on a series of books. It is uh, it's space opera. Um, it it could be also considered hard science what fiction. What, what does that mean? What does space opera mean? Space it opera. Meaning- it's soap opera, but it's in space. Uh, it's- <laughs> soap opera in space. Okay. Yeah, soap opera in space. Um, the melodrama. I don't see the melodrama in this in this in this TV show. Isn't a soap opera melodrama? It is. It is melodrama. I think that they sort of use that term loosely. Um, what's another? I mean, I think that Firefly was space opera as well. It's big, grand, sweeping stories that are told in space. So, um, I don't actually. I don't know if Star Trek really qualifies. Star Wars, I think, is space opera. Um, but uh, I guess, could we consider that part of the romantic genre? Akin to uh, Ayn Rand, we don't have characters acting. This was not romantic to me. This was very like everybody had a mean sense of life. They were killing. They didn't trust each other. There was no for the least the first seven episodes, nothing hopeful. I didn't find. So where would where do you see romantic? Well, most of the most of the people. Sorry, Jax, to get off t- tangent like that. I don't want to get off too much on a tangent, but. I mean, we're 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 living with belters for the most part, who are sort of an abused population, and uh, and so I can see where they where they get their sensibility. If air and water, two of the things that we take for granted, two resources we take for granted here on Earth, are are you know deprived them whenever they uh, whenever they act out, I think I'd be pretty upset as well, right? Pretty per- perpetually upset if I felt crapped upon by. Yeah, that was another part that was I struggled with was the fact that I actually thought I didn't know anything about these books. Um, and I and after I was started to watch the show, I was like, oh, they must have been written a long time ago, because surely we the, the whole thing of having belters in space doesn't even make sense. Why wouldn't we just have robots doing that work? Um and I, when I looked, I saw the books were written very, fairly recently, like. 2011 or something. Yeah, it was pretty recent. So, so I was really having a hard time with that whole storyline because I just don't think they would be that. Why would we spend a lot of time putting a bunch of grouchy people out there who are protesting when we can just, and already, I think we would have built robots to do that work. Well, maybe it's um, less expensive to do it um, with people. I mean, they, they still have <laughs> Congolese slaves mining our lithium in in the congo yeah Yeah, we don't have robots that are that are doing that Mm -hmm. but um i think that there was also sort of an implication and you get it later on i think in the series that the um that that there's just massive population and uh late i think it's probably in like season two where um christian played by uh uh, shora agdashlu um i'll just call her christian uh, where the the UN, um, or she's the the high up in the UN, like the undersecretary or something, um, where she basically says we have, you know, we we don't even have enough jobs for people on Earth. Um, but it's interesting because the UN has sort of become, you know, in effect a socialist society, and uh, and and the, I think the romantic part of this is it is ideas there are some really big ideas the martians dream of terraforming they they dream of converting their their dust bowl what they you know call it into a into an oasis like earth um they dream of having their own air and water um i think that that william holden or sorry we're not william holden um that james holden the character james holden is a romantic in in terms of his values and his ideals he actually becomes he turns he he sort of starts out at this as this unlikely and un and he doesn't want being a hero but he eventually embraces being a hero and i think that we see that toward the end of season one um as well like i said i i loved it i loved um all of the characters i really enjoyed the interaction that they had, I love the, each one of them has a really, really interesting arc that plays out over the series. You get hints of it in season one, I think. Um, but, uh, and the, and then there's this budding romance between Naomi and, uh, and James Holden, this, uh, this attraction between the two of them that grows and. 
Start I like the I like the geometry there because Amos is a spoiler for that, right? God knows where his obsession comes from. Do they ever delve into that? The the reason he's so loyal to her, like a dog, but like a man who's utterly and totally in love with somebody. Uh, what's interesting is he's not actually. I mean, he is in love with her. I guess in the in the way that Eddie Willers would be in love with with Dagny, but I I never. I never took Eddie Willer's love for Dagny very serious. I, I hope that I don't get Ayn Rand lightning bolts shot down on my head. But um, but it, it, it his, it's his admiration. Love, it, it's it's deep deep admiration. There was she took care of him at a time. It does come out, and his backstory is really interesting too. You get that I think even in season one you get that he grew up in brothels, um, and he had a, a very uh, a very difficult um, obviously childhood in that regard. And I don't and he's kind of one of these people who never I, I the sense I get is that she sort of became his moral compass, um, and he'll he'll do whatever she says basically. Um, there is a there is a standoff between. Holden and Amos, uh, where it's it's clear that Holden and Naomi are together, and 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 he was afraid of telling Amos about it, and he finally tells him, and Amos is like, "Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I figured I already knew," uh, and he's like, "Oh, I thought you were gonna like, you know, I thought I thought you were gonna be angry at me or like beat me up because you love her," and he's like, "Yeah, like a, like a sister, more like a sister." But I mean, if she wanted to have sex, I'd have sex with her. It's always uh, in typical very Amos practical. fashion. He's a very practical man, uh, and he has a kind of practical wisdom, which is interesting to me that he defers to her as a moral compass. He, he definitely does not have a moral compass beyond I'm surviving, regardless of what happens. I'm going to do what I need to do for myself. And his his clarity is actually very interesting. He's one of the more compelling characters. I wanted to get to the bottom of, and to the roots of his story more than pretty much anybody else in the piece. I can't look at Stephen Strait without thinking of my friend Sam Witwer. And I wonder if Sam Witwer, you guys know Sam Witwer? He was in Being Human. We were in Being Human together. He plays Darth Maul. He's sort of in this sci-fi universe. And, you know, he did that show. He was number one on the call sheet for a sci-fi show. And I'm wondering if they had him in mind when they cast Stephen Strait, because I can't not see Sam Witwer in this part, potentially doing a more interesting job. I have to say, um, in deference to my friend, uh, and, and I don't mean any uh, any knock to uh, Mr. Strait, uh, but um, he, yeah, I think I think Amos is one of the more interesting characters of the world. I didn't find myself so interested in Naomi, despite all the the mystery and hubbub that the Martians were able to create around her character as a potential spy, as a potential you know saboteur. Uh, it never quite piqued my interest with her. Uh, what about you, Jennifer? Were there any characters that you found completely compelling in this? Yeah. Did, did you I, find I, as compelling as I? I, I was attracted to the, the, the parts of the story where there were the deepest character development or arcs for at least season one. So um, that, that was the, um, the detective dude, what was his name? Joe Miller. You know, uh, yeah, played by Thomas yeah. Jane. I liked his story. Like that was an interesting story. He was kind of, you know, like struggling. He had this relationship with this other police chick. And yet he kind of falls in love with the mystery woman he's trying to find out more about. And so much so he leaves this planet. Like I enjoyed that. And as it got got it went along I enjoyed it even more I wanted to see where it was going I also um kind of like Jim Holden he was starting to get interesting especially when you saw where he came from with his mom in Montana um other than that I felt like a lot of the relationships were kind of surface um I absolutely could care less about the whole UN story every time that came on I was like wah 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 <laughs> just oh. It's Why because it her accent, it's what? possibly because the accent and voice timbre are so difficult to understand. It takes a lot of work to get through it. This is a this is a point of acting for people. Uh, like if you're on stage and you speak with a low volume, people people have to strain to hear you. They're going to tune out. 
Uh, that's why there's a certain degree of technical soundness when you work that's necessary. People have to strain to hear what you're saying or sort out what you're saying because your accent is so strong, unless that's part of the piece, like in uh, uh, the Brad Pitt movie that Guy Ritchie did, uh, where he played the Irish fighter. Oh, fighter yeah, that. I know which one you're talking about. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. But he, he was supposed to be incomprehensible. You're not supposed to understand the guy, and that's part of the comedy. This, you're supposed to understand what she's saying because she's she's in the intrigue she's she's in the political intrigue that's going on while while the jane character joe miller is in is in a different type of thing the undercurrent they're both on the same trail looking for the same people whether they know it or not and you got to hear the stuff that she's saying because it's sort of important um but you're right uh, general i'd agree with you i thought joe miller's i thought joe miller's uh journey was was heroic and romantic and very interesting and I did and I like that he fell for her too that's that feels straight out of detective noir right that's that feels like a Philip Marlowe thing going on and uh, I like that they that was part of the story and I'm interested in seeing what happens to him maybe in the next season sort of but he he he, he grabbed me secondly to Amos who's who's just an ancillary character he's not really a pivotal character in the piece but his I, you know I, I wanted to know more about him and when he gave me tidbits about where he grew up and how he grew up I was like ah that explains a lot about why you are so predatory and so as clear he says he's as clear as a lion in the Serengeti doing what it has to do to get through that day to get through that month and I love that about him I I, I like him he definitely uh, stole the scenes. I mean, every scene that he is in, he owns the scene. He's he's the most, he becomes the most interesting character um, in that scene. Another character, I'm trying to remember now if if you guys, if we saw her in season one, the Martian, um, uh, Bobby, the, the, she's the, the, uh, the Marine Martian, the Martian Marine. I guess I don't I don't think she shows up until season two, which is a shame because she's probably one of my favorite characters in the entire series. Um, and and she's she's the person who, you know, dreams of terraforming Mars and um, is, is trying to even though she's a warrior, you know, she's kind of like a little girl and like, I just want rivers and streams and air. Uh, but uh, I love that. I love that the Martians are moral, intensely moral. I don't like that they're sacrificial and sort of collectivistic, but I like that you know the Spartans too in their day were admired for their ethics and for their strong morality. Even though you know it's not any a kind of society that we would want to live in, and it's not successful by any stretch of the imagination when you en enslave three quarters of the population so that you can play war games. Um, you're not going to have a very successful or innovative. Uh, place to live and sometimes I felt like it was it was the Peloponnesian War but in the future what did you guys think of of Julie Mao when you finally get to see her and to the to the, to the fullest extent in the later episodes episode nine and ten where they flash on what exactly happened to her I'm I'm sorry I had issues with her crying and, and I'm going to say this in a uh, I'm not going to say what I was going to say I have issues with her crying and babbling even though she's in a terrible situation a life or death situation when you find out, you know, when, when she's been built up all through the series as this woman who left wealth and privilege to fight for what she thought was right, you don't get, that's, that's not somebody who weeps easily or cries in an emergency. That's somebody who gets through it and maybe has the emotions later. So I had I was a little disappointed with their with their directions, you know. Like Are you she talking about when the, she was like locked into the to the airlock? Yeah, or yeah. Um, not a fan of I, any of that. When she's locked in the compartment, when this when the when the uh, uh, the suit came floating up at her, and she you know screams, she's afraid of everything that's around her. I get I get the fear, but she, you know she's been painted as somebody with a certain type of metal that I just don't see actually doing it like that I, I as the director I would not have made those choices they went for the I, I feel like they went for the emotional hyperbole they went for the the, the tears and the snot or what they thought would that be was tears that's the melodrama that's the <laughs> bad it's bad when, when, when there's a fake quiver in her voice when she's trying when she's calling out for help no good no good I'd rather have her you know be strong and she doesn't you know be strong and fighting through it rather than you know the scream queen, which she sort of turned into in that moment. 
Did you guys have that same feeling or is it just me being an asshole? I didn't pick um, up on it. No, I don't think you're being an asshole, Mark. Um, uh, I'll let you know when you are. Um, but I think that, so she, it was interesting because there was so much, and maybe we're saying the same thing in a different way. There was so much buildup to her, right? Like I needed her to be worthy of Thomas or of, of um, Miller, Detective Miller falling in love with. And I didn't feel like she matched up to that. I didn't feel like she leveled up to his love for her. Um, it, there was there was something that that was unimpressive about her. And I think it's because I didn't see her taking much agency. I just saw her, even though, you know, the story of her is that she does, right? But I just, I didn't see it. And so the stuff that happens to her is very reactive. Um, and like, even in, you know, she's got some, it, like, you think that, I mean, she's dead, but like, she's not. Um, but what happens in, in season two is pretty interesting. Um, but even then. Oh, wait. wait, what? You just gave a major spoiler. She's not dead. Uh, no. You just saw her fully cordyceps in the, in the, in the shower. Well, you guys aren't going to watch any more of it, are you? Are you guys going to watch any more of it? Uh, no. Okay, so now is it, does it have anything? The cordyceps to do? become, she becomes alive with the cordyceps, with, or not the cordyceps, that's from The Last of Us, is it? Uh, the, the protomolecule. It it's the it's the proto molecule. It is alien. Um, it is alien life. The the proto molecule. The she and the proto molecule basically meld and merge. Um, and uh, and and she even though uh, and then the let's see where did we leave Eros? Eros. We left Eros. Uh, remember the the planet or the what with the rock, the asteroid that all of the proto molecules infected and they and they just irradiated all of them and we're running tests eros ends up becoming um completely taken over by the proto molecule and it's it springs into alien life and actually like and this is the part that is hilarious but i'm just gonna i'll just give it away any anyhow the other one of the other things i really loved about this show is that the only lasting religion is mormonism <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. Yes, I noticed that. <laughs> the religion <laughs> that lasts throughout the ages is Mormonism. And they have this dream. They have, the Mormons have this dream. They have this huge ass ship that Fred Thompson or, or Thomas, I can't remember if it's Thompson or Thomas in the, uh, uh, has, is, is helping to build at Tycho Station. They have this massive, massive, it's like, you know, the love boat times 50, and they're going to sail off into space to find God. Uh, in, in, in the, and they're bringing all the Mormons, right, that they've been collecting over all the centuries and bringing all the Mormons with the, oh, thank you, uh, thank you, and so are Fred Johnson. Uh, they, uh, and so, the but in order to now they've realized oh god eros is this uh is this living thing and we need to destroy the proto molecule because it can be dangerous so tycho fred johnson commandeers the mormon ship that is supposed to take them to paradise and and tries to like drive the asteroid into the sun uh but then the asteroid uh what becomes alive with the proto molecule and then it and then the story just like takes takes off into really really interesting crazy places from there because you actually see what happens when alien life merges with the humans and provides uh uh provides pathways different different dimensions for them to enter into different worlds for them to see so um if uh yeah <laughs> there's another character that colonel frederick lucius johnson that I feel like I should have been interested in because he had an interesting backstory. He was called the butcher, right? So he's a he's a killer oh, of, yeah. of rebels uh, because he he was the one who ordered that I guess that that striking station to be obliterated. That was and Fred I, Johnson, I, I thought. It's it's Fred Johnson. Frederick Johnson. Yeah. Or Frederick Johnson. The, yeah. The, the oh, the sorry, I missed. Now, now engineering all this new technology for the Mormons. Um, I, it, that's, that's a story that was telling me I should be interested in it because it, it had some, 
it had some interesting uh, mysteries to it. You know, I wanted to know why the arc was he sincere now? What was he fighting for? None of that was necessarily clear to me, which is good. I like having to unravel the character. It's just that I thought the 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 guy himself was a bit weak, and the the dialogue they gave that poor guy to to, to do was was stilted and unfortunate. And I found that in some of the cases that the that the dialogue, I found the dialogue to be a little bit hard to listen to. It didn't have the it didn't have the air of a conversation. It was just it it was transcribed directly from the book uh, into the scene, and it doesn't quite work. So I couldn't get on his page as interesting and compelling as the as on paper as it looked. And was that just me? Did Chad Coleman do it for you? Uh, well. Well, I'll let Jack answer that because I had a comment that was off the, off of Chad, but uh, more on the acting, but it had to do with the UN group. So, if, oh, go ahead. Just, in just in terms of dialogue, I'll just say his. I didn't think that his dialogue was the best. Um, I'm a fan of that actor because he was in The Wire, and I loved. He had a, a much more to me actually a much more interesting character in The Wire. This is the problem when you see actors that you love in different roles you're like oh I wish he was I wish he was more of like the actor in the wire kind of thing but what were you going to say Jennifer that was all I had to say on it yeah I mean he he was I, I felt the same there was something interesting about him it didn't go far enough or deep enough to really uh unravel but what I what I don't know if it was the writing or the acting but the whole UN <clears throat> The way that all of those interactions happen with that, what's that Christian, what's her name? The, the Christian, woman, yeah. Christian lady. I don't know her. Um, and every person that she acted with, it felt like I was watching amateur actors. Um, I felt I kept taking me out of the story because it just felt so rigid and wah, 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 wah. I, I, and I think that was probably the reason why I never got into the story. Maybe they, they got their legs later and got better at it, but I was, it was so far gone. Um, I didn't get that sense in the other two storylines. They seemed to be a little bit, uh, I don't know if they had better lines or they had better acting or what, but there was a, a, a big distinction. It's almost like the B team was rolled out for the UN story to me. I, you know, what's interesting <laughs> is I will say that, so, so I think the expanse went for, to somebody, I'm sure one of our fans can correct me here. Um, it went for two seasons on sci fi. I think I wanted to say longer. I think it went longer before it was picked up again. Before it was, it was picked up by Amazon. And when it got picked up by Amazon, there were it looks like you're drinking a moon. It looks like you're drinking from a moon, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> or a planet um mm -hmm. but uh but the the writing did change and the production value actually changed as well when amazon oh, really? picked it up it it um they threw i think they threw more money into it um the um i i do recall um i'm just trying to see three seasons on sci-fi uh three seasons on sci-fi and then to and then to amazon um, which, you, you know, it's, it's really interesting. It's the nature though of, uh, of the entertainment industry. Right. And it seems to be happening a lot more recently now that there are streamers that are able to pick up canceled network shows. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they can, they can satisfy, or they can, they can deal with less viewership because of their subscriptions. Um, they can put more money into it, but, uh, but yeah, I would. I think um, it was interesting, Mark. You talked about how Naomi wasn't that interesting a character um, for you. Probably a more interesting character for me that is is sort of um, uh, built as kind of a um, a peer to Naomi is Kamina, who is Fred Johnson's head of security, uh, his uh, his right hand woman, head of security, and she's a she's got a very thick belter uh, uh, belter accent. Um, but she, to me, is a she's a really great character who has a really great arc, and and you see her grow throughout all six seasons. Um, and she is more compelling to me than Naomi. Now, Naomi is given a really interesting story as you get further into the um, as you get further into the series. It turns out that she has a child 
who was taken from her by her father, who is sort of a terrorist and is wanting to um, destroy both Mars and the Earth. And she's set, she's pitted against him to, uh, she's pitted against him not only to um, stop what he's doing, but also to stop the, indoctr the, the continual indoctrination that he is providing to his son. She's trying to save his son. And it, and it very much, you know, I which I thought was kind of bold in times like this to make the analogy to actual terrorists uh, and, and Muslims. And because, you know, we never want to like offend them. But this really put it out there. And I, I applauded them for that, for being very bold uh, with it. I also want to give a shout out to Kristen Hager, who, who played, I think, in the first one or two episodes. She was uh, she was Jim Holden's lover. Who had something to tell him before the ship exploded? Um, she was uh, she was one of the principals on Being Human, a show that I did for the Sci Fi Network. She came in the last two seasons, I think. A pretty interesting uh, character, good actress, and I liked I liked her in the, in this piece as well. As 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 short of uh, uh, time as she was in it, I thought she elevated she elevated it and served as uh, Jim's conscience. And mm -hmm. sort of the catalyst for him, uh, uh, for him going to try to rescue that ship. Right to go to the distress, uh, distress call. We have a couple of super chats that I wanted to read from N. Somer for Canadian ten dollars. Thank you. Some of Rand's premises that I saw in play in the Expanse is that quote, "There's no morality on a lifeboat," end quote, and that anarchy easily gives rise to bad evils. Really. What do you guys think about that? No morality on a lifeboat, and anarchy easily gives rise to bad evils. I think there was, there was a character. I think Amos is the perfect example of the of lifeboat ethics, where you know it's not about ethics for him. Although objectivists marry ethics and practical action, uh, he doesn't. And, he, and to him, what's right is what allows him to live and you know get to the next moment. Um, but we we do see precisely that. We see that within these life or death situations, we see ethics playing out. We see we see them, you know, living by principle. And and Jim starts out as the guy who's sort of a pragmatist and doesn't think that you know um, he should live by principle. But his girlfriend, you know, brings him around. I think so. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't know that I necessarily agree with that premise. Because you see these guys in dire situations behaving in a, a principled way, even though I, I get this, I get the, I get the sentiment behind the idea that you know, it, there there is no right or wrong when choices is, is is so pared down to life or death that it's you or the other guy. You really can't. You really, it's not really a moral situation, right? It's it's the morality lives in the in the world of choice, um, and you can you can. You, you can't really say that a person in such dire situations is really is really given the types of choices that would make their actions moral or immoral. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I mean, my point is sort of I'm straddling the line there, aren't I? Because I'm saying on the one hand, these folks did act according to principle. And that's the arc of the main character is that he be, he goes from a guy who doesn't care and is just sort of skating through and trying to you know, just not hit too many bumps on the way around. To a guy who does care and embraces doing the right thing, even though it's costing him. That's a hero's journey for me. And that's very worthwhile. I agree, because even when Holden, um, when uh, when he does make the decision to go out for and answer the distress, the distress call, um, and then they get as far as um, stealing the stealing the Martian ship, the Rosie, right? They could have they they could they could have just been off on their merry way. Um, and not given a damn about anything else they could, you know, they could carry whatever scrap or they could, they could be traitors, um, and not have, not care about the fate of humanity, right. Or the fate of the, of the universe. Um, but he does. And, and I think it is, it is in, in part of the, it would the, the inciting incident for Holden, at least was his girlfriend in the beginning, you know, speaking to him as a conscience. Um, and you, 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 said, just... you said later on a, a libertarian esque themes sort of enter into the plot because I was trying to I was trying to figure out where the author 
understood with respect to uh, government and society. Uh, because you see a, a Cold War scenario with two power, one sort of opulent and decadent, and the other, you know, moral and clear. Sort of, we get the same dichotomies that we get today with materialist materialism and 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 principled behavior, as if the two can't coexist with each other. And and you get these poor, abused people who are more or less being crushed by imperial powers. Who are just exploiting them for the resources and the labor that they have seems very Marxist to me. Seems very collectivist. I don't. I don't get the sense that the the governments are anywhere to blame or the states are anywhere to blame. It's just that we're running out of resources because we don't know. We're just running out. It's because man sucks. It's because man abuses things. Even Jim Holden says at some point he left to go to the Belters because we were killing the earth or something like that. Um, so I, I'd like to know where this libertarian, even hint of objectivist premises come in, because I don't see it yet. No, I don't see it in season one. I started to see it in season three when you spend a lot more time with the Belters and uh, Kamina is is now in charge of the former uh, Mormon spaceship, uh, and uh, which and it's hilarious because like they've they've totally redone like the decks and everything, but they still have all these Mormon pictures up uh, in the background. Um, I, I think the set design on this was really I and costumes I thought were really great um, on the show. But um, you see Kamina actually say she wants to um, uh, she wants to make an example of one of the belters who was stealing drugs or dealing some kind of drugs, but like and she wasn't aware of it and something was going on. And she explicitly states, we let our people put whatever they want into their body and do whatever they want to their bodies as long as they don't hurt other bodies while they're doing it. Which was well, very much. I feel like the left goes that way, don't they? The political left is like they understand body sovereignty because it's obvious you're you're separate from everybody else around you. They don't understand material sovereignty or right to property or any of that other stuff because that seems made up to them. And libertarianism is about self sovereignty, but also about what you do with what you have and mm. full whole sovereignty over what you do with what you have so well, I'm, they're I'm, also I'm, not about the belters are not about imposing um governments on each other which is why they have so many different factions um they they don't and and the the one belter that is trying is in that shows up in seasons five and six or maybe it's four through six um, is uh, who is trying to unite all of them and is sort of like the terrorist figure. He represents, you know, the evil part, not not the evil part necessarily. Well, it could be with some people could consider it the evil part of libertarianism. I don't know. But he he represents like the governing body, like the move away from um, freedom of body and freedom from government to being governed, because that's the only way that we're going to preserve our people and and win against Earth and Mars. Um, but those those uh, uh, let me read some other super chats just to just to get to them. Um, Hannah's with the star. Welcome to the new member. So I guess is Hannah a new member? I'm not sure. Welcome, uh, Jonathan Honing for $1.99, uh, giving us a hippo. Thanks, Jonathan. And then Apollo for two pounds. Uh, this is a this is a bit of an off topic question, and it's something that we could probably devote an entire episode to. But I'm gonna I'll I'll pose it. What makes a good actor and screenwriter? <laughs> the screenwriter tells good stories, and a good actor acts them well. There you go. Uh, you got your answer, Apollo. <laughs> well, I mean, there's going to be you know different sensibilities with respect to that, but I think a good actor is authentic. You get the sense that they're engaged and having a real experience based on what's happening in front of them. And a good story and a good writer is a good storyteller. They they create um, the, the character starts in one place and finishes in another place, and they have to overcome a lot of trouble it's to get there. And usually, they don't get what they want; they get what they need. And those are, I think, uh, you guys can correct me on the writing part of it. I'm not a writer, but um, 
that's what I sense whenever I read a, a script that's good is those sort of dynamics are present. And as the actor, I just have to just say those words and do those things and mm -hmm. as if they're real and have those experiences to the best of my ability. I think a good writer also has to be, um, I, I hate to sound all like ethereal about it, but a good writer has to listen to the characters. It has to be true to the characters. You have to, that's why maybe in some of the, when, when um, Jennifer was talking earlier about some of the dialogue um, just didn't feel like authentic. Um, you know, you have to make sure that your characters would say that. And you can't just make them say things and do things that they just wouldn't do. And that's really difficult because it's like, but wait a minute, you're creating it. You're, you know, you're the one that's masterminding this whole thing. Um, but you really, a, a character starts to take on, if you do a good job, I think a life of their own. And it's your job as the writer to, to do the best for them. And what we've had to learn over, over, I don't know how many revisions of scripts is we've had to learn to trust the actors too. Um, trust the actors to to do what they do with that character. I think I, I agree with all that, Jax. Um, I think a good screenwriter is a lifelong learner because becoming a good storyteller is so many skills that you have to learn from not just how to develop a character and their arc and that change that the audience needs, but how do you start the story with a hook that grabs the audience and brings them in? And um, how do you use really good storytelling elements like introducing mystery and then paying it off and paying it off at the right moment when the audience needs it? Um, and then introducing new mystery so that you don't run out of it or um, doing plot twists um, where you need to, or studying like we do here, um, other TV shows, other films, other script, reading other scripts, how do the masters do it? it? This takes years and years and years of work. And I still feel like there's so much to learn. I, I, I can never, I can never learn and read enough scripts, go to, go to enough seminars, read enough screen playing a, a book, how-to books. It just seems like there's um there's a lot out there to uh, to hone in on the craft, but um but definitely worthwhile. It's a fun, it's a fun yeah job. and even though the, the writer uh has to be able to tell a good story and the actor has to be able to relate to that story emotionally, behaviorally. I think what they both share in common is that they have to be good communicators. Mm -hmm. um, that's what both the writer and the actor are. Just like a musician reading notes off of musical notes off a page and, and playing those notes. It's not that he's playing the notes that make it good. It's not that the notes are there that make it good. It's that the, the, the musician is speaking through the instrument, communicating through the instrument, right? When you watch somebody like Jimi Hendrix play the guitar or, Stevie Ray Vaughan, they're not just playing, they're talking with the music. And mm -hmm. um, the actor is doing that as well. He's he's filling out the role with his relatability to the part. Um, and so, yeah, communication is key in pretty much pretty much everything. Um, so uh, did, we, did we cover what we needed to with respect to this, guys? Um, what, what, how, how would you... So we we think it's noir. We think it's romantic. There are romantic elements to it. Are any of the characters comparable aside from Amos? And I hate to say that the the, the possible sociopath is uh, is comparable to a Rand character, but his clarity just was very attractive to me. Um, is there any other character in this that you would consider a character that you could see in a Rand novel? I could. I actually, to me, Jim Holden, and I guess because I, I know where he goes over the seasons, he is comparable. Um, a character that we haven't talked about much is their pilot, Alex, who I think has an interesting story as well because he's an ex-Martian um, from the Navy. And he, and he was never a, um, he's a pilot, right? But he, would, he was a, a glorified truck driver, basically. 
And now he is he's he's stepping into this role of being a, a fighter pilot and a um and a tactical person. Um and he becomes as the seasons go, he becomes an even better pilot. And he's got this story that he um uh, I think we find out in season two, maybe he has this really interesting story that reminds me very much of a of a Rand character where he he's left behind. So he was on the um, he was I think he was on the ship that got blew up. I'm not sure how he survived the the Don the Doniger the Doniger. Um, oh, oh, and Summer's asking me about um, about Monica. You're going to have to remind me who Monica was. Um, but, uh, but Alex was on the, um, he was on the Doniger. He left behind a wife and a child. And what's interesting is that he, um, didn't, he, he felt that at first he believed that he was better off with, or that they were better off without him. And he sends them a message finally in, um, he sends them a message, uh, after like after a year or something, I think it, it happens in season two at the end of season two, where, um, he says, it's taken me a long time to realize this, um, that I love what I do more than I love being at home. And, um, and he, and I mean, he was already kind of estranged from his wife, and he was saying, I love you guys so much, but I love what I do out here more. And that's a really hard thing to admit. And his wife, of course, sends him a message back like, fuck you, we don't need you, you know, we're done. Uh, but then his son later sends him a message. His son is on Mars and he's in his um, he's in his back suit. Uh, and he says, dad, I'm really proud of you for what you do. Um, you know, you, like I, I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for your mom says that we don't need you, but you know, I know what you're doing is good and I'm really proud of you. Um, and his, his is a really, he has a very, uh, I will say his, his ending is, is, is tragic, but it's heroic as well. Um, which doesn't happen until I think season six maybe, but, um, um, but, uh, but yeah, so that it's was another character. Actor, it's always what an actor wants to hear. I have an ending, but it's in the last season. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay, so uh, Monica is wait, the real quick. I want to know, wait, wait, wait. I want to know real fast is Colonel Frederick Lucius Johnson a bad guy or a good guy? Um, he's a good guy. Okay, so the good he's guys a, are the ones fighting for OPA. Um, not all of them, not all, not all of them. Um, but he's, he's trying to be, well, let me put it this way. He's trying to be a good guy. And, uh, um, you know, he's the, you find out, you know, he's called the butcher, right? Because he blew up those people. I can't remember in season one, um, if uh. they revealed it, but you find out that he didn't get the information that they had surrendered. Um, that information wasn't communicated to him. You, you know what you, you know what I like about this too uh, is there are good and bad guys on every side, and, and to some degree you're able to empathize uh, with characters in each camp and not like characters in each camp. So that sort of enables you to uh, pick and choose better. You're not being it's, you're not being led down the path like say when you're watching a James Cameron film like Titanic. And the rich people all suck and the poor people below the decks in third class are all awesome and living life the way you're supposed to live it. You know, right. I feel, or Avatar, God forbid, where it's like, you know, the, the mechanistic capitalistic forces are all assholes and sort of like conflated with mili militarism and violence and death. And the natives, you know, are in touch with the trees and they're all the good folks. There's, it's so black and white. And in this, there's great Martians and there's you know, there's suspect ones in OPA. There's people really fighting for freedom. There's people taking advantage of their exploitation to to get power. And in the UN, there's people like Christian who are trying to get to the bottom of a real issue. And there's the corrupt politicians who are pulling the strings uh, behind the scenes, uh, who you hope she, you know, can in some way uh, checkmate down the road. And I'd be interested in in hearing at some point, maybe we don't have to do it today, but if she does end up checkmating those politicians who very clearly harmed people, 
um, for their own reasons. Uh, you mean the, uh, who do you mean by she, uh, Christian? Christian? The the UN, uh, yeah, she's, I mean, again, she's got, she's got an interesting arc as well. I, I mean, I guess, I guess this sort of begs the question, if the series gets better in seasons two and seasons three, is that this, is that a sign of a, of a bad series? Cause shouldn't it, shouldn't it like be good from the start? Right. Um, I, like I said, I don't, I think season one is probably one of the, is, is out of all the seasons, the weakest season. Um, I, I would wish for it to be the other way, right? Like with game of Thrones, once you got to season eight, I was like wanting to slit my wrist. Uh, but, uh, but season one, Tracy, of game couldn't, even, Tracy couldn't even get into like episode seven or eight of that. She thought it was, uh, like medieval porn. Uh, after which it the, is. And maybe after the, the eighth or ninth nude scene, it's like, okay, I've seen Jason Momoa naked enough. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So I wanted to, uh, and Summer was telling me about Monica. Monica doesn't show up in season one. She's the journalist. And yes, I think that just to answer your question in the chat. Uh, yes. I think that she's, uh, she's definitely um, a good guy too, except I'm trying to remember because I'm just seeing her now more in, in season three. I think that she's got a good arc as well. Um, so, uh, you guys have anything else to say? Jennifer? I have a question since you're the space guru of the team, Jax, how does this compare to other space TV shows you've watched? And like, what's the best one? Like that you would really recommend? You know, it's so funny that you, that you asked that aside from Firefly, uh, <laughs> cause we all know how much I love, 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 love Firefly. Um, I know what you're you know what I'm gonna say? We'll see. If, write it down on a piece of paper. Um but <laughs> <laughs> um I so I love the expanse. Um I love it for uh just it's like massive, massive like space opera quality and just huge, you know, galactical things are happening. But I would say the space show that I would, aside from Firefly, that I love is Lost in Space, the redux of Lost in oh, Space. Oh, The classic huh? Lost in Space, the old no, 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 classic? No, the, re, the redo. The redo oh. of Lost in Space. Um, I would have said battles, the redo of Battlestar Galactica, um, but... I just, I had to, the last episode, I had to condemn everything about it because it turned into a bunch of Luddite bullshit. Um, but it was done really, really well. What do you think I was going to say, Mark? You said yeah. Battlestar. Huh? I said Battlestar. I thought you were going to go Battlestar. I knew you hated the last, the last, uh, the way it ended. I don't know if it was the last episode or just the way it ended. Uh, but I thought Battlestar for sure. Because I've, I've also heard that from other people. Battle, Battle, Battle I mean, Stars Battle Stars is my close second, but I just learned that uh, um, I just learned that Lost in Space. Um, I must have missed it. Season three is out already, and it's only three seasons. Um, it's one that you would actually, I, I, you know how much I hesitate to say, Jennifer, you would really like it. It's one you would actually like because it is a. Um, it's so it's from the it it gets you from the the very beginning. You're invested in this family. It's the family Robinson. What the, I mean, I grew up watching Lost in Space and uh, like the 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 '60s or whatever it was, the black and white. You know, Danger, Will Robinson, Danger, uh, and the, many a Halloween robot. costume. Uh, the, what they do. So have you you haven't seen Lost in Space, the Redux, Mark? No. What what is it on? Um, it's on Netflix, I think. You guys would both actually really like it. Um, might have to add that. I go out, I, I go out on a limb here, uh, which I, I normally don't do because I never know if you guys are going to like something, but uh, <laughs> I go out on a limb that you guys would like Lost in Space. What they do with the robot is really interesting um will robinson is a great character the whole family robinson um is super interesting um and it's a story about this family which is great which is you know it's like you can tell a story anywhere in space on earth in a cave whatever but if you if you're married to the people that 
are you know the characters and you you know you care about all these characters yeah um, right well, i'm gonna have to check that out because i was sort of a fan of the of the tv show um and uh well maybe what was the, doc what was the doctor's name dr dr smith it was Doctor bad, the bad guy who was always getting, who was always just about himself and and getting them all into trouble? Yeah, and they've turned her into a woman, which I think was uh, in this, which I think is is really interesting. Played by um, Doctor Smith, Posey, uh, Parker Posey, who I I love oh. hating her. I absolutely love hating her. Uh, yeah, she's funny, but. Uh, well, I know we have a, we're going to have to have a little bit of a break. Nate, this might be kind of wrapping up season two of TV talk. Maybe we can watch all three seasons by, before we, to kick off season three of TV talk. We haven't really talked about that. So I don't want to. Why don't you guys, why don't you guys watch like the first two episodes of Lost in Space and then let me know if you're into it. Okay. Um, and then and then we'll decide because I don't want to make any commitments to all three seasons or to a show yet um, without uh, it's not like I need you guys to love it. But, you know, you should be interested enough in it to, to want to watch okay. it. <laughs> so, so originally, originally uh, Lost in Space was created by Irwin Allen. That's a name that blasts from the past. Wasn't Irwin Allen the producer who produced all those? gigantic disaster flicks like the Poseidon Adventure and the Towering Inferno. Earthquake. Are you talking about the original TV show? Uh, yeah. Well, they have him on here as a creator. I'm assuming that uh, he was an original creator. Yeah, he passed uh, okay. away in 1981. Interesting. Uh, he did win an Academy Award. Well, interesting character, uh, a graduate of New York's Columbia School of Journal Journalism magazine editor, producer, director, but he did all those fantastic uh, disaster movies that plagued us in the 70s, which I don't think any of my, uh, uh, our audience here would are old enough to remember those movies, but I went to them at the drive-in. I saw The Towering Inferno with Steve McQueen and O.J. Simpson. Oh, I saw it. I, yeah, yeah. I remember he saved, he saved a cat, literally O.J. Simpson in The Towering Inferno. <laughs> saved a cat. Two decades later, murders his wife. Um, well, but he saved so, the cat, which is why everybody still loves him, I guess. I don't know. Uh, oh, God. Hey, so we have a, uh, a special announcement um, this Sunday at 3.30 p.m. UK time. Uh, the ARC UK channel is starting a new study group with James Valiant on Leonard Peikoff's course, History of Philosophy for ARC UK members. And the session will also be live streamed to YouTube members. Um, that sounds actually really interesting. I can't listen to that course enough. Um, that has been a uh, Peacock's, Peacock's course on uh, the history of philosophy. If you guys haven't heard it or been part of it, I highly recommend that course. It teaches you a lot. Great course and James Valiant commenting on it and uh, working on it moment by moment, parsing it, taking it apart, analyzing it. Is going to just make you deeper objectivist folks so that sounds really good i guess we've come to the conclusion of the expanse for me it's a tepid sideways thumb not a thumbs up uh, but not a thumbs down either i'm sort of intrigued it's a complicated world there's a lot of information there i'm sure i missed 60 percent of it and probably have to do a redo watch um there's there's a some flaws in it but there's some great things about it as well i like noir i like romantic uh i like romance in in the artistic sense and in some respects this does uh cover those uh those genres for me so uh you know a sort of a thumb quiver jennifer you have a thumbs down right yeah mine's more like yeah i want to like a space show i just <laughs> i'm gonna try to i'm gonna try for lost in space and see if it, i get what i want out of it <laughs> you'll like that. You'll like that more than Battlestar. I would, uh, I, I'll bet. But uh, I give the expanse the thumbs up that nobody does. Uh, I'm giving them your thumbs up or my thumbs up. Uh, but uh, different, different strokes for different folks. Yes, that's what makes the world go around, folks. Well, you heard it here. <laughs> I guess that's all for uh, Ayn Rand Center UK's 
TV talk. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of a hiatus and we're going to figure out what show we want to do next for, is this season three or are we season three season of TV talk? Wait, we, we, I guess we should do an award show like we did last, uh, last time. Well, yeah, we didn't we'll do that. All, we'll sort all that out on private time, uh, but we'll figure out a show guys that we can all watch. Lost in space sounds very compelling to me. I'll look at the first couple episodes and see for myself. Uh, until that time, folks, keep watching TV. Keep us, keep us informed on what television you think we should be uh, talking about here and how we can look at it through an objectivist lens, because we are in culture wars, folks. And uh, hopefully some of these analysis, even though we don't go very deep, uh, can help you sort of unravel uh, the craziness in our culture and make some sense out of it. Until that time, folks, remember to always check your premises. Peace. <laughs>